1778, Friedrich Anton Mesmer astounded Paris and the medical world by introducing what he termed a new medical theory, the theory he called animal magnetism. Although he was discredited and accused of being a practitioner of black magic, mesmerism was to continue to fascinate medical men till it flowered into the present day wholly scientific and important branch of medicine called hypnotism. That is today, but a century and a half ago, it was misunderstood and misused, with many of the men who practiced it unprincipled and little better than sorcerers. This is the story of one such. Dr. Newton, you may now wake up. What? Did you say something, Professor Valdemar? Quite a good deal in the last five minutes, Doctor. Good Lord. Is it five minutes since you put me out? Believe it or not. In another few minutes, I'm going to let you judge for yourself. I'm going to let you put me under the influence. Our mystery drama, A Living Corpse, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Robert Dryden and Kurt Peterson. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Listerine Lozenges. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Have you ever been hypnotized? It's a strange, weird, and terrifying feeling to know that you have lost your identity, blanked out. That you have still been in your own world, and yet not of it. A powerful, benign tool in the hands of today's doctors, rigorously trained. But once, as recently as a hundred years ago, it was a secret art shunned by the reputable and condemned by the devout. Yet it had its devotees. Men of inquiring scientific minds as well as the charlatans, and the legion of believers who have followed the lure of the occult down strange paths since the dawn of time. Oh, oh who the devil? Oh, oh, Professor Aldemar, it's not the police. Calm yourself, Mrs. Salisbury. No need for alarm. But for the moment, it seems we must wait to bring you relief. Oh. I will turn off the pacificator for the moment while I answer the door. Oh, if it's the police. Mrs. Salisbury, the art I practice is not illegal. However much it may be frowned upon, Mother, no nothings. And besides, I shall close the door to the room and leave, and you will be quite safe. Oh. Very well, I'm coming. Coming, but better make sure. Who is it? Dr. Craig Nugent. By your appointment, Professor. Oh, uh, one moment. Enter softly, my young physician, and keep your voice low. You were expecting me? Yeah, earlier, much earlier. Your arrival now is awkward. I'm sorry. I, I was held up on a case. If it is inconvenient, I could return at some other time. No, 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 no. As a matter of fact, perhaps it works out all to the good. I have a patient with me I was just about to put under magnetic influence. You will have the opportunity to see and observe. I come into this room, but softly, sir. Very well, Professor Valdemar. I would have you in the same room, but the lady is anxious to preserve her anonymity. However, if you will come to this spot in the wainscoting, allow me. Just slide this small shield to one side, and it opens the eye on a portrait in the next room. 
you will well be able to observe the technique and practice of mesmerism. At that moment, every instinct within me screamed in silent warning for me to run. But my venal ambition and unbounded curiosity nailed me to the floor. I put my eye to the back of the portrait's eye, and as clearly as if I were present in the adjoining room, I watched in jealous awe. One human being attained total mastery over another. Oh, what was it? Who? Oh, nothing, nothing at all. An errand boy I sent him packing. Let me start the pacificator. Uh. Now I want you to relax. Oh, I can't. I can't relax. Of course you can. I want you to watch the pacificator over my left shoulder. Oh, the light is so bright. Only to begin with. Just watch. Listen to the sound. And watch the spinning disc. Relax. Relax. You want to go to sleep. influence spread to you and around you, warming and relaxing and making you drowsy. You are falling asleep. You can't fight it. Your eyes are drooping, drooping. The tension is draining away. And now as I lay my hand on you and touch you, you are asleep. Sleep. Sound asleep. You will lift your right arm to shoulder height and hold it there steadily. So. <coughs> well, Dr. Nugent, are you still there? At the peephole? You need have no fear of speaking up. She will not hear you. <laughs> You're certain she won't? Just as certain as I am that she will continue to hold out her hand and arm straight from the shoulder, no matter what weight is placed on it. Yes, observe. That heavy, cold scuttle. She couldn't possibly hold that with her arm as it is. Oh, but she will, and she can. Look! That's impossible! With mesmerism, nothing is impossible. So... <coughs> oh, she need hold this no longer. The point is proven. You may put your arm down now, Mrs. Salisbury. That's right. Now, do you still have your headache? Yes. My temples are bursting. It's like a knife plunging into my brain. If I could only get some relief. Ah, you say that you would pay anything for that relief? Anything. Mm, very well. Tomorrow, you will remember this when I wake you up. Tomorrow, you will go to the bank and take out $10,000 and deposit it in my name as the Boston Federalist. I promise I will do as you say, if you will only give me relief. I lay my hand on your brow. I pass it gently to and fro. And as I do so, the pain diminishes. Oh. Diminishes. Oh. Till now, it is gone. Yes. Oh, yes, it is gone. Oh, what oh, joy, what peace. It will not return. When I wake you, you will know that it will never return. It will never return. And you will forget everything we have said about the money. Uh. Till tomorrow, at ten o'clock exactly, 
You will make the transaction. I had watched all the foregoing in open-mouthed amazement. A woman cured of incurable migraine headache, for when she woke, it was gone. A woman paying him $15 for the session, but who had promised to deposit $10,000 the next day? Stunning revelation upon stunning revelation. And the most stunning of all, why this tall, cadaverous, cough-ridden man should reveal his secrets and his criminality to me. I had not long to wait for the answer to this. Well, Dr. Craig Nugent, <coughs> were you edified and intrigued? Both. I am astounded, but... Yes? Uh, at the moment, as a doctor, perhaps intrigued more than anything. Uh, that cough of yours, sir, is that the reason you bid me here? Yes, <coughs> and no. Uh, we sit and talk. Uh, first, I would prefer to osculate your chest, sir. Form some opinion of... Forget it. Wiser physicians than you have examined me. <coughs> the consumption is too well advanced. My death is inevitable and in very short order. There is no hope. Then why am I here? If you will sit with me, doctor, because I certainly find myself weak and tired, I will attempt to explain. Uh, but first, let me ring for my wife. I am sure you would enjoy a glass of port as we talk. In any case, I am anxious to have you meet her. I'm sure the pleasure and the privilege is all mine. The idle phrase gagged and stung in my throat. Luana Valdemar was, as always, that vision of loveliness, scarce above my own age. Violet eyes, great and deep enough for a man to drown in, skin that seemed translucent to an inner glow, and, and a dark cloud of jet black hair tumbling to her waist that set my heart pounding so loudly I, I thought all three of us must hear it. In one first look... I was in love, enchanted, and in chains. What will you have, Dr. Norton? Uh, oh, I... Uh... Port is for older men. May I suggest this brandy? Uh, my dear, this is a bright young doctor whom I expect will loom large in my... <coughs> in our future... Dr. Craig Nugent, may I present my wife, Luana? Your servant, madame. Ah, uh, no. I am yours. Will it be the brandy? Whatever you suggest. Luana's suggestions turn out to be more like commands. <laughs> uh, leave us, Luana. We have much to talk about. Don't stay up too late. I hope to meet you again, Dr. Nugent. I sincerely hope so, Madame Valdemar. You will. You will. Now, off with you. Whatever you command, my husband. You are not drinking your brandy, Doctor. Mm? Oh, oh no, I... Yes, sir. It is uh, excellent brandy. I... I don't quite understand why I was invited here in the first place. Of course you don't. I think if you will entertain my proposition, you and I have a great deal to offer each other. For a beginning... <laughs> Excuse me. If you would pour me some, some more port. Of course. <laughs> and once I have soothe this accursed scratching throat of mine, I can make a start about explaining... <laughs> explaining all about the end. As he reaches for the glass, Professor Waldmar's tall, gaunt figure is shaken by yet another bout of the racking cough that snatches away all his breath. 
In medical dismay, young Dr. Craig is helpless to do anything to relieve him or to imagine what on earth kind of service he can offer this strange and half-dead man. I shall return shortly with Act Two. For the moment, as the smooth, mellow port seems to assuage the paroxysm of coughing by the older man, Craig has been eyeing him clinically, dispassionately. Now, suddenly, from under the shaggy brows, he finds that the professor's dark, smoky eyes are burning into his and beyond them to his brain. For a second, he can almost feel the world slip away from him. And then, with an effort, as he tears his eyes away, he finds himself his own man again. <coughs> <laughs> That's a wicked cough, Professor Valdemar. Yeah, yeah. I am beyond medical help. However, you might still help me. How would you like to know all my secrets? The study of a lifetime. You have one thing I never had. That precious sheepskin, that open sesame to accept by everyone. I could never put anyone into a sleep or for a trance. Oh, you could. If you knew the secret, all it takes is that. A and you are prepared to tell me that? If you prove as apt a pupil as I believe you will, and on the giving of a solemn promise from you to me... I, I am a little bewildered. I, I, I don't know what to say. You need not answer tonight. It is late and I am very tired. But I must know by tomorrow. For my time... Well, I don't have to tell a doctor. My time is short. Must I make the promise before I learn the secret? No. Then suppose I refuse to give it after you have taught me what you know. You won't. I promise you... You won't. I left that strange house with my head spinning. I'd walk there during the twilight, but now it was almost pitch dark, my way lighted only by an occasional street lamp. I hadn't gone more than 50 yards from the door when suddenly a figure swam suddenly out of the murky gloom. Come with me. Juana! No. no! Oh, it's too dangerous. He might see us. Up here, in the shadow of the postern gate. Oh, dear Lord. I nearly fainted when I saw you in the house tonight. What brought you there? He summoned me. What did he want? Oh, he knows about us. No, darling, no, no. Although he knows too much about too many things. The man is evil. He, he makes my flesh crawl. How could you have married him? I told you. A young girl has little say in picking a husband. I think he mesmerized both you and your father. I know he did, Papa. He left every cent to him to pursue his work. I have nothing. Well, what's done is done. I still want to know about Amadeus and why he summoned you. He had heard somehow of my interest in mesmerism. How? I don't know. Not through you. Are you mad? If he knew about us, if he even suspected I had ever met you before. Oh, it doesn't bear thinking on how could he know? We've been so careful. Never too careful with him. He's diabolical. I have a terrible feeling he knows. And if he ever did... If he ever did, what, what could he do? Ruin your career? Shame me as an adulteress? Oh, <laughs> he has other ways to punish us and make us crawl. What other ways? You'd have to have his mind. Cruel, vicious, distorted, and half mad to imagine them. Oh, but worst of all, my darling be separated forever. No, not that, ever. No way to stop it, unless... Unless what? Unless we got rid of him, killed him no, somehow. No need for that. Providence will provide in time, and very shortly. You mean he's dying? In the terminal stages now. He knows it as well as any of us doctors. And the safest thing is for us to stay apart until it happens. Not even see each other. No need for that. I must come back to the house tomorrow. Why? Well, 
He's offered me a strange proposition which I, I feel I can't afford to turn down. In return for a promise, he, he will teach me the secret of a mesmerist. What promise? I don't know that yet. Don't listen to him. Oh, I beg you. There's no need for concern. Now, he will teach me the secrets first, before my promise. And even after I have given it, who says I must live up to it? It's a trap. Oh, I know it's a trap. Please, Craig. At least let me find out what cheese it's baited with. Then let me make up my mind. If you can. I should have listened to Luana, but other compulsions were driving me on. I don't defend myself. I was everything that Valdemir himself had named me, and I had to gamble. I couldn't pass up the chance of a lifetime. So, my young friend, you have decided to accept the bargain, yeah? At least to listen to the terms, Professor. Yes, yeah, by all means. Would you believe that I could put you in a trance in, say, one minute? No. <clears throat> Let us proceed then to test that by example rather than precept. No, 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 no. Please remain seated. I am just placing this lamp behind your head so that you are in shadow and as I move to sit in front of you, the light is full on my face. Now, I ask only one thing, that you focus your entire attention on my left eye. For one full minute. Do not let it waver and do not interrupt. Let us both check our watches. Right. Whenever you are ready, look as I asked and indicate for me to begin. Very well. I'm ready. Look in my eye. Think of evening skies at dusk. The clouds drifting softly lower and lower. Shadows across your eyes, their weight heavy. Heavy and gentle on your eyelids till they want to close. To close. You feel all the tension drain out of you. Lose. Lose like a rag doll and you want to sleep sleep your eyes are closing and the lids are heavy heavy with sleep sleep you are now fast asleep Dr. Nugent but I'm not I'm not asleep at all huh <laughs> of course you aren't. <laughs> That's the secret, you see. I'm afraid I don't see, sir. There's no magic magnetic influence that flows to the subject. The subject is a magnet that asks for, draws that influence to himself. It is his desire that creates the trance, conscious or unconscious. He must want to be mesmerized. You did not want to be. You resisted it with all your might, didn't you? Well, naturally. I thought if it was an experiment, that was what was expected of me. It was. This time you will cooperate, or at least not fight me. I don't think you can do it, Professor Valdemar, but I will try to cooperate, if I can. Uh, look in my left eye. Think of evening skies. At dusk, the clouds drifting softly lower and lower. Shadows across your eyes, the way You are now fast asleep. Asleep. Dr. Nugent, can you hear me? Ah, not even the blink of an eye, huh? 
I could cut your throat from ear to ear for the horns you have put on my head, and you would be none the wiser. But softly, softly, you shall be made to pay in time. First, I have a use for you. Dr. Nugent, I tell you now, you can hear me. Do you? I hear you. I suppose it would be useless to ask you to admit that you and Luana have been having an affair for months. Who is Luana? My wife. I just met your wife last night. For the first time? You introduced me to her. Uh Very well. We shall leave that alone for the moment. Just to prove to you that you really were in a trance and to keep you thoroughly on edge about how much you may have revealed, I want you to forget all of this conversation, including what I am about to tell you. At six this evening, you will take off your left shoe and bring it or give it to my wife, saying... A bouquet of roses because I love you. And to hell with the old fool who does not know what is going on. You will remember, Dr. Nugent? Yes. You may now... Wake up. What? Did you say something? Professor Valdez? <laughs> Quite a good deal. Did you really put me out? Yeah, I believe it or not. I'm going to let you judge for yourself. I'm going to let you put me under. (laughs) But uh, first, it is time for me to ask for my payment and your promise. I hope I can deliver. So do I. (laughs) As you can hear... I have my own doctor whom I trust implicitly. He finally has told me that my life can be measured in hours. I want you to promise to be by my bedside. I want you to do for me what has never been done before. I want you to mesmerize me in articulo mortis, in the act of death. But just before it, so that the old man with the scythe will be stopped in his tracks. In momentary stupefaction, Dr. Craig Nugent hears and tries to absorb this amazing request. Stirring and moiling beneath his frozen amazement at the audacity of the conception, a barrage of questions, speculations, revulsions, and doubts struggle for expression and cry out for answers. I'll return shortly with Act Three. before the middle of the 19th century. Physicians were just beginning to grapple with physiology, the process of life, death, the great mystery still, and perhaps forever, was then a total one. There existed almost no apparatus to prolong life, such as is common practice today. Death then was inevitable. It was occasionally predictable, but always total, except in the case of Professor Amadeus Valdemar. Easy, lady. Easy. All right, Luana. I have ladies' bridle. Let me help you dismount. I can manage. Watch from there. She's as nervous as I am. Let's get back in among the trees by the river. Why did you risk passing me that notice? You saw me out? I heard you make a promise. 
I hope you have no intention of keeping. You heard? The secret of the peephole in the portrait I discovered long ago. How? Because on the few occasions I've been able to resist his magnetic influence, pretending to be under it, I have watched Amadeus like a hawk, hoping against hope somehow to find a way to freedom. Oh, it will not be long until you do. Not with your help. What do you mean? Until I met you, Craig. What do you think has kept me alive during all these loathsome years? The knowledge that at least when he died, I would be a rich woman. But if he doesn't die, how can I inherit all his wealth? He will die. Not if you keep the promise you made. The one of my darling, now listen to me. Even if I did keep it, the body is finite. No occult power could keep it alive or stop the disintegration of the cells once the heart has stopped and the blood ceased to flow. But suppose you are wrong, Craig. Suppose you put my husband just before death into a, a kind of suspended animation. Then what? If he is really on the point of death, I can always bring him out of it, can't I? I don't know. I don't trust Amadeus. He... He knows about us. What makes you think so? I will quote you his own words once he had put you under. I could cut your throat for the horns you have put on my head, and you would be none the wiser. You shall be made to pay in time. Oh, Craig. I'm still not convinced we cannot outwit him. We are not in control. I am, or I will be. Oh, do you really believe that? Oh, Craig, you are so naive. What do you mean, naive? I know exactly what I'm doing and exactly what I plan to do. And no one can take over my mind unless I want them. Uh, oh, excuse me. Here, my love, a, a bouquet of roses because I love you and to hell with the old fool who doesn't know what's going on. What? Your boot? No, 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 take it, this bouquet of ro ro roses. One of my boots uh, uh, that I'm holding in my hand? The left one, just as he told you, to offer me as roses at six o'clock tonight while you were mesmerized. Now do you see why I fear him? He's always one step ahead of us, all the way. The next ten days passed in a strange torpor, a dreamlike state that paralyzed all thought made me function like an automaton. Session after session with the professor, perfecting the techniques of mesmerism, both the establishment of the trance and then the careful methods of bringing the patient out of it. No mention of anything beyond the clinical, except the closing question each time. You still do solemnly promise before death takes me that you will put me under the influence. To my automatic reply, yes, sir, Professor, I, I do solemnly promise. Until, finally, the fatal day arrived and the messenger came to fetch me to fulfill my given vow. <laughs> uh, how is he? Thinking fast, barely holding on to life. I must hurry. Why? Let him die. It would be a blessing for all of us. I can't do that, Luana. You realize if you keep him legally alive that I am left with nothing? You have me. I don't have you. I can't have you. As long as I'm married to Amadeus. We can go on as before. No, we can't. Not even if I wanted to. People will be watching us now. But I love you. How can you and make of me what you plan to? A nurse to a living corpse, tied hand and foot to its service night and day... You keep him alive, and I might as well be dead forever, as far as you are concerned. I climbed the stairs, outwardly calm, but inwardly a seething storm of emotion and indecision. At the open door to the bedroom, I stopped. Is that you, Nugent? Yes, Professor. Where is the name of conscience have you been? You still wish to be mesmerized? Wish? I command it by virtue of our compact. 
and your sacred and solemn promise. Which I might choose to break? Oh, no, my dear doctor. I told you you will keep that promise. If you entertain any notion of not doing so, I have made certain provisions to make you weigh your decision carefully. What provisions? My affairs are in the hands of my solicitor. Not one penny goes to my wife by virtue of an early marriage settlement, except an amount enough to maintain my body in suspended animation with her as its keeper. How can you demand such a monstrous thing? How could you, with your young body and easy morals, have done such a monstrous thing as steal her from me. I beg you to understand it was not her fault. I have no time to listen to your son. <coughs> Remember the boot and the flowers? Yes. You mean... How can you even speculate on what post mesmeric suggestions I have implanted in your brain during our sessions. Ah, you see, I have thought of everything. And now, make haste. The shadows are gathering. Hurry and do what you have been trained to do. Within five minutes, I could perceive unequivocal signs of the mesmeric influence. The glassy roll of the eye was exchanged for that unique expression of uneasy inward examination. With a few lateral rapid passes, I made the eyelids quiver, as if in incipient sleep, and then closed them altogether. I then stiffened the limbs of the sufferer, the legs at full length, the arms nearly so, the head slightly elevated. By all the vital signs, pulse, respiration, the contraction of the heart, I would say yes. No. No, wait a minute. Look at him. At his mouth. He is moving. He, he isn't dead, but... No. Just sleeping and waiting. For what? For the cure. Huh? When it comes, then wake me so that I may live again. But there is no cure. Not in sight. So much the worse for you and your beloved. You had better pray with me that it comes. And soon... <laughs> Oh, you chose your precious conscience over me. Hush. Trust me. How can I trust you? You tried to assure me a corpse could not be mesmerized. Not quite a corpse, but soon. Now, believe me, Luana, the physical properties cannot sustain life no matter what the mental state. Now, it is only a matter of waiting until he dies. <laughs> we did, hour succeeding hour, day succeeding day, and week and month, until finally it had to be faced. Moribund the professor might be, dead he was not, nor would be till brought out of trance. Don't you see, Laura, this has always been my way out. If, if the worst came to the worst, Physiologically, there is not enough strength to maintain life. Now, at last, with, with a clear conscience, I can do what I never promised not to do. I, I can bring him out of the trance. Why have you waited this long? I, well, I, I could assign many reasons, but suddenly I, I realize I don't quite know. Only, only that we wait no longer. Professor Valdemar, can you hear me? Are you asleep? 
No, not asleep. What then? Dead or alive? Somewhere in between. What are you waiting for? A cure. There is no cure. And we cannot wait. I'm calling you back. Are you... Are you so sure? You were the teacher. You taught me how. I also never stinted on the warning. What warning? That there is no trick. It all depends on the subject. On his will. What he is willing to do. to him as his nurse, myself forever trying unfruitfully to bring him back from that halfway house, either to life to reason with him, or to death for his own peace, and ours. In the Hall of Records, having heard this strange tale... I busied myself to look up the principles. The records are fragmentary and incomplete. There is no mention of Amadeus, but I did discover two death certificates issued in a case of accidental drownings, or possibly a suicide pact, listed in police files. The names were Dr. Nugent and a woman identified only as a Mrs. Vladimir. Close enough to prove or disprove our story? Does it matter? I'll be back shortly. One loose end remains. The body of Professor Valdemar. That I could find no trace of. Only vague hints here and there of a cult that believed that death might be held at bay by placing bodies in suspended animation, much as the proponents of cryogenics or deep freezing propose today. Amadeus Valdemar could have been reawakened and long ago cured, and with the passage of time, gone to his ultimate reward. The only thing that tends to irk is that I'm sorry to tell you, we'll never really quite know, will we? Our cast included Robert Dryden, Kurt Peterson, and Patricia Elliott. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Would you advise me to take the old road or the turnpike? Oh, why? The old road is over 120 miles. The turnpike but 97. You impose on me. It, it is wrong to trifle with a traveler. You know it is only some 40 miles from Newburyport to Boston. But this is not Newburyport. This is Hartford. Do not deceive me, sir. Is not this river I have been following, the Merrimack? Oh, no, sir. You are just outside Hartford. And this river is the Connecticut. Have the rivers changed their courses... As the cities their places, am I forever? Uh, uh, but again the clouds are gathering, the storm is at my heels. God curses me for that fatal road. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Listerine Lozenges and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.